Oli and I have been working on installing this solar array here. These are 405 watt rigid solar panels and we have 12 of them and they're going to be feeding into our F3800 system. Now the way that we're going to group these is to take these first three and then the last three, so those are two groups, and then there's three and three here as well. And let me give you a little view of what the wiring is looking like. Uh, we're trying to figure out the most efficient way to run our wires and these three here are grouped together right now and it's it kind of breaks my heart to not be able to run them like really super detailed like over here we started to do it we've got our wires coming down and they're neatly zip tied to the edges of the rails but for the sake of efficiency this is much better over here we just have our cables coming directly over and then they'll come down into that piece of unistrut that we're using kind of like a tray to hold our wires. And by doing that, we can have these two panels right here directly connected together with our Y connectors there. And we only have to use one extension cable to go from this point over to our end panel. So uh, we'll be able to bring our main wires uh, right to here to go straight back to our F3800. So we're just going to do that same grouping and that's that's going to allow us to use all the standard connectors that are included with these panels without having to make a bunch of custom short little pieces of MC4 with MC4 crimps on the ends. So that kind of gives you a good picture of this. You can see we just use these beams. We're about 14 feet across here and our angle of the panels is set to about 33 degrees. So 33 degrees on the panels, and I think that's our best year-round angle here in Minnesota. We're using these angled brackets here that are adjustable, and I'll link to them below. But Oli put all those together. How was that process for you? Uh, fun, except for at the very end, I put one with the wrong angle. The wrong angle, yeah. So we looked down the top row, and one of them was like a little bit different, and so... We had to adjust adjust that one, but it's pretty simple. You just take out those two uh, two bolts right there with those hand screws on them, and then you can change the angle to whatever you need for your area. Or we could even change them twice a year, like change them in the winter so that they're more vertical, and change them back in the summer. Do you want to do that? Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. I guess we could tilt them up a little bit more, but. Anyway, so that's how it all came together. Uh, it, these are temp, the beams are temporarily clamped just so that they don't slide. Uh, but I'm going to have a more permanent mounting situation eventually. Anyway, so over here, uh, you can see we've got good sunlight right now. And it's kind of cool in the container here how you can see the pattern of our overlap of our panels. So we've got some margin there. So as it gets later in the year and the sun's at a, a more sideways angle, that gap will get narrower. So it'll be interesting to observe that as we get more towards uh, winter time. Uh, but I think that this is a pretty good configuration uh, for having pretty optimal production. So with the sun shining right now, Oli didn't like the fact that we were wasting all that power. So he's got this temp temped up right here. This kind of gives you a good example of how the wiring actually looks when it's not organized uh, but we've got our extensions down to our Y connectors here so this is going to three panels one two and three and that comes into our container here where Ole's got an F3800 plugged in and it's unfortunately at 100% so we're really not taking advantage of what we could but each solar array so we've got two different arrays, that one that you saw uh, that we put together nicely, as well as that temporary one, that are feeding into our two XT60 ports right here. So those are looking really nice. Uh, but basically, we can bring in up to 1200 watts per XT60. Now we have to stay within these voltage ranges, and that's why we had to run some pretty heavy gauge cable so since, since our F3800s aren't going to be permanently in the container, we want them to be in the house. Oh, what's this one at right now? Oh, uh, I'm going to put the expanded batteries at 99. 
Oh, okay. He's going to top off the last of 1%. <laughs> so since our F3800s aren't going to be permanently in the container, we actually have to run some cables back to the house. So, and you, as you can see, it's pretty far away. So we chose to run eight gauge PV wire. Uh, now, not only is it eight gauge, but we're actually gonna run two sets per panel set. So every three panels is gonna have a total of two eight gauge sets of conductors, which I'll show you those. Right here you can see all of our PV wire. And this stuff is heavy and uh, we tried dragging it from the opposite end and we couldn't do it. Like Oli and I were both pulling on it. Like maybe if uh, if uh, my life was on the line, I could probably do it. But um, this stuff is substantial. So each set of four panels is gonna have these, this many cables. So we'll be paralleling two positives and two negatives with each set of three panels. And hopefully that'll reduce our voltage drop enough uh, so that we can have more optimal production. In theory, we could get by with half as many cables, but we just have a little bit more voltage drop and lower production. So we're gonna actually test that, obviously, when we get this all hooked up. I'll test it with just uh, four sets, and then we'll go with eight sets and see how much it changes. Now, every time I have a trench dug, I'm always thinking about other things I need to put in the trench. So I've got uh, ethernet conduct conductors, as well as uh, some power cables that are gonna be going up into the shed here. I strategically dug my trench past this little shed so that if we wanted to, we can update and remodel the shed and use it as a little solar building. So we could put our battery systems in here and make this be kind of a more permanent spot to put uh, a bunch of solar equipment. But for now, we're gonna be uh, putting the F3800s in the house, but we're, we've got provisions here. I was even thinking to bring my two inch PVC up into here, bring my PV wire up through here and then back down again and to the house. But since these cables are so hard to handle, I'm not really sure if that's a good idea uh, or if it's just gonna be practical. So we might just still run those straight all the way to the container, but maybe add uh, our two inch PVC coming down and out and kind of align it so that if I needed to later I could just dig down to that spot and then interrupt our two inch PVC going all the way across because we are running our PV wire in PVC even though technically uh, it's rated for direct burial but you're kind of just shooting yourself in the foot if you don't have some conduit in the ground uh, but it is kind of painful to buy it because it is you know, hundreds of dollars. Each each 10 foot stick is like around $17 right now at Menards. So there's that. So up here at the house, we are getting ready to pull all of our cables in. So we've got to go through a crawl space about 10 feet or so. And then we will be into the basement where we'll get all of our final connections made. Oh, one more thing I want to show you. Over here, this is my cable unrolling device. And it has worked super, super well. This is, uh, I built this back in like 2010 uh, out of some half inch black iron and two by fours. And it's super, oh, I'm gonna trip and fall here. <laughs> it's super nice and easy to reload. And we've taken these, uh, these old, whatever you call these, spools that had 12-2 and 14-2 on them. We cut one end off, Oli did it actually, and then we were able to slide each roll of PV wire onto this so that um, we could much easier, or have a much better time unrolling it. I guess I can show you here the way we marked these. We just used different color tape, and we've got single red, double red, single blue, double blue, and so on and so forth for our four colors to mark which set of cables each one of these belongs to. So always important to do that because if you don't, you're gonna be really bummed out that you didn't. <clears throat> now here, I'll show you what I was talking about. This cable is almost impossible to pull. 
each one of these cables is 300 feet long. So we have 300 times 16 cables. That's how much wire we're dealing with. And actually, if you include the ethernet wire that we've ran, we've ran over a mile of wiring back and forth between the house and the containers, which is just kind of insane. Right here's a, another interesting thing to look at. This is 16 conductors in a two inch PVC. You can see that we've got a lot of space in there still. Now this is the bell end. If you look at the other side, it'll give you a little bit more accurate representation. Right there. So that's our conduit fill with this many solar wires. Just kind of interesting to observe. I do want to point out that optimally you really want to have your solar array as close as possible to your house. But for where we're at here, if you take a look at the trees, you can see that we've got a lot of big trees up here around the house, which we appreciate for many reasons. So the closest spot that really had decent sunlight was down over there. And we do have some trees to the south that we may have to eventually trim back a little bit, but uh, that's definitely not that big of a deal. And even if we do leave them there, uh, once the leaves fall off, which is, it's only gonna affect them in the winter time, uh, because during the summer, the angle of the sun will be high enough that it won't matter. Um, but once the leaves fall off, you really don't get that much shading from them. So we'll see what happens. I'll try to gather some, some data on that and decide whether or not it'd be worth it to, to actually trim those trees back or not. But yeah, what a beautiful fall day. One thing I know is that guy over there is really a hard worker. What are you pickaxing? Um, nothing. Nothing. Just looking impressive, huh? So yeah. he's been working with his uh, 19, or actually this is my 1985. Actually, is it the girls' is? They haven't bought it yet, but. Uh, 1985 Honda TRX 125, which you have your own TRX 125, oh, right? Yeah, this one, uh, I don't like it. Uh, compared Only to Oli's, oh, <laughs> Oli's is way cooler. Mine so, way better, wait, have yeah. you made a video about yours yet? Uh, not yet. Hmm, you better do that. Mm. So, I will link to Oli's channel right up here. So, if you guys want to see his video about his TRX 125 that he hasn't made yet, so quiet, make sure yeah. you subscribe. The Hondas are a little bit cold-blooded in general. My so. whole brother's not. You get it going, it never stops. Yeah. This trailer, too, has been so useful. Anyway, we're getting off topic. So look at this uh, old electrical. This is what feeds the farm site right now. So this is all slated to get upgraded at some point because we only have 100 amps coming in right here. So I am, I do, I am curious what your recommendation would be I could bring the the replacement power up, and I think I'm gonna bring in provisions for 400 amps. I really only need 200 though, uh, but I'll bring in the necessary conductors for that. And I can either bring them into the house and then have the power distribution from the house out to everything here, or I could leave it here on this pole. I think we would be replacing the pole. Leave it here. You think leave it here? Yeah. I'm leaning then towards. I can come shut off. Oh, it's scary. Going in the I'm actually leaning towards putting it in the house. And I'll tell you why. Uh, a lot of it has to do with the solar. Because right now, since all of our solar energy just comes straight into the house, uh, that basically means that anything that's fed directly from here can't be backed up. Uh, so, uh, or it can't be fed by that solar. Um, and I'd like everything to be able to be on the automatic backup because like we have a couple freezers over in that garage And so right now if the power goes out we have backup energy in the house, but not in the outbuildings We have batteries we can carry them over and Just carry yeah, Ola can carry the batteries over and plug it plug them in but uh, So my thought is if I bring the the new power into the house then we can use the old cables that used to feed the house to feed back out to this pole and then feed out to the different buildings because we, we know that we have, I had a mark there with those flags, we have the, a, a cable going from here to the garage, 
from here to the well house, which is behind the garage, and from here over to the barn. It actually, it actually goes via the garage. It goes to the garage and then to the barn. So all of that stuff, unless I want to dig new wires in, uh, I can just immediately repower it as long as I, if I use those 100 amp wires coming from the house back to the pole. So that's kind of what I'm leaning towards. But comment down below if you have a different idea. The other options are to set all of our main, main power equipment in that little building right there and then feed from there to the house and the barn and the garage. Uh, but I really just think the house is gonna be the way to go. And uh, they said that they could also move the transformer. Let me show you guys where the transformer is real quick. It's out here at the end of the driveway. So right out here, we've got two different boxes and one of them is a junction box and the other one is our transformer. Now the kind of risky thing about having them out here is that when you are plowing in the winter time, because we get huge amounts of snow up here in the Northland, uh, this is kind of, it's, it's mostly out of the way. I think honestly it's probably fine. Uh, so I think I'm leaning towards leaving it here, but we could have a move the transformer closer to wherever we want the power. Well, we've made it to the end of the day. It is now 6.30, sun is just setting. And this is how far we made it. We have all of our conduit pulled all the way to here. So we're like 110 feet in. And we're kind of holding up the end of our PVC before it goes down in the trench. And then we assemble each section and continue on. So I think we're going to probably have to pause here for the night. Although we might be able to get a couple more on. We have to slide nine more about nine more but we're definitely not going to get everything all the way assembled up to the panels so it's just a lot of work a lot more work than I we'll anticipated yeah we'll see you on Monday so we made good progress but we're not done yet